Um, so I think we should get started. <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Fundação Rui Cunha, to Rui Cunha Foundation. Um, it is uh, truly rewarding to um, come across uh, uh, this attendance uh, to this, uh, um, I believe, very interesting and valuable uh, seminar that we'll be holding here. So first of all, uh, welcoming you uh, to greet Dr. Rui Cunha and uh, once again <clears throat> to thank Rui Cunha Foundation. As always, as I always say, uh, we truly feel at home here um, and it's, uh, we have this warmth which is really important. Um, we're here today uh, as, as, as an outcome of uh, uh, something which uh, we would not anticipate until some time ago, but uh, we realize that there's a great deal of, uh, I would say, convergence uh, or shared interests between uh, these two worlds, which have way more in common than one could anticipate. I um, had the for I was fortunate to have uh, come across the, uh, the Macau Institute for Corporate Social Responsibility in Greater China. Um, um, uh, that, was, that was actually the first time I was more familiar with that was at an event, uh, interestingly held at, at WIN, uh, 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 one of the first large scale events of this, of this association. Uh, and as corporate social responsibility uh, is ranking these days pretty high in terms of uh, the public discourse and it's been set as a priority, it can mean different things and entails different layers. Um, so, uh, uh, and one of these layers is our role in the society, uh, especially against the backdrop of uh, these challenging times brought by the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's where we uh, got together um, our association, the Macau Portuguese and English Press Association, and the Macau Institute for Corporate Social Responsibility in Greater China, when we were holding a charitable event um, our association, we collected funds to donate food um, for Caritas Macau um, to be distributed among, among uh, uh, Macau-based citizens in need. And the um, MICSRGC uh, played an inter a valuable role with a very um, a significant contribution. And then we thought, we thought oh, there's, there's uh, something really in common here with regards to CSR. So that's how we um, came to this uh, um, event, to the seminar accounting and media ethics of corporate social responsibility. I'd like to introduce um, uh, our two guest speakers, um, uh, Carlos Noronha, Vice President of uh, the Macau Institute for Corporate Social Responsibility in Greater China, and also um, an associate professor uh, the Faculty of uh, Business Administration of the University of, um, of Macau. Um, he has been publishing extensively on these matters um, and is a, is, a, is a leading researcher uh, and, and has been inspiring uh, other younger researchers together with the community of, uh, of the uh, of MICSR GC that we have here with researchers, professionals, uh, scholars from different higher education institutions uh, and also different professional um, um, backgrounds uh, here. Uh, the other speaker is, uh, is an old friend as well, uh, João Francisco Pinto. You probably are familiar with him as a news controller of, uh, of TDM's Portuguese channels. And he's also uh, president of the general, just chairman of the General Assembly of, of the Macau Portuguese and English Press Association. Uh, he um, has also been lecturing in local higher education institutions. So um, he has been based in Macau, correct me if I'm wrong, since 1994. Yes. That's right. <laughs> Good memory. <laughs> That's right. Uh, uh, well, if I am going to tell you since when Carlos is based in Macau, then I will let everybody know your age. So <laughs> I will dare not to do that. <laughs> so just a couple of decades uh, or a bit more. So Carlos is a mechanist, is a, is a um, Tom Sang uh, is someone who's very committed to the development of, uh, of Macau. Um, so now um, I would uh, like to ask uh, MICSRGC, uh, the Macau Institute for Corporate Social Responsibility in Greater China, 
uh, to present the letter of appreciation um, to Rui Cunha Foundation. Um, so I'd like to welcome uh, to this stage uh, Dr. Rui Cunha uh, and Dr. Teresa Chu, um, President of the General Assembly of, uh, of, uh, of MICSRGC. Um, now I'd like uh, to ask João Francisco Pinto uh, to, uh, yes, <laughs> it's a, a surprising thing. Uh, so, uh, a so uh, letter of appreciation presented uh, by uh, Teresa Chu uh, to João Francisco Pinto, President of the General Assembly of IEPIM. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and now, thank you, Dr. Therese. Um, well, we should get started, right? So um, the first presentation by Professor <coughs> Carlos Noronha, Associate Professor at Faculty of Business Administration and Vice President of the Executive Council of uh, MICSRGC. Right, Please. so it is you, my, um, oh, so it is uh, exactly my pleasure to be here and actually um, I have been actually dreaming of giving a seminar at this very special venue uh, <laughs> for many years and uh, I finally got this chance. Um, so today our topic will be divided into two parts. All right. In our first part, uh, in my part, all right, I will mainly um, focus on um, so this is the acknowledgement that we have made already. Okay, so um, in this first part, um, my presentation is basically on some um, issues about accounting research, which um, many of you may have uh, some kind of uh, mysterious uh, belief that uh, what is actually accounting research, all right? So what is the difference between accounting research and finance research and so on, all right? So, um, and how does accounting research relate with uh, media information? So that is very important, and that is my first part, all right? Okay, so let's look at uh, the contents that I'm going to present today. So firstly, we will talk about uh, some stakeholder relationships. And you can move and accounting information characteristics and different kinds of accounting research methods and also um, where do we actually collect those, uh, uh, this information uh, concerning accounting research and therefore relate, uh, relating to the media, all right? So let's go over this one by one. So firstly, uh, the first part is um, there are many theories that we can actually use to support our research in accounting, but um, <clears throat> one of the main theories that we often use is uh, what we call stakeholders theory. Right? So here you have a, a little bit complicated, but actually not very complicated kind of uh, relationships, all right? So we are talking about a firm, okay? And the firm has different relationships with uh, many different uh, entities, including 
say, for instance, um, governments, for instance, right, including when a global firm is going to invest in a local government or um, the legal requirements and so on, right? So institutional, uh, uh, international institutions, like for instance, say the UN, the EU, uh, IMF, World Bank, etc. So they will have also uh, put some kind of um, requirements on the firm's investments. Right? Uh, industry associations, for instance, um, non-government NGOs, all right, like for instance, say some pressure groups, for instance, say Greenpeace and Transparency International, uh, which is very famous about um, ranking uh, corruption levels, right? Markets, financial markets, of course, all right. And our main concern today is about the public opinion, right? So that is why we are talking about the, um, the influence of media, right? Because, um, say, like for instance, you can see press, TV, or religious institutions, and also the academia may uh, impose, I, I mean not impose, but say put different uh, requirements or pressures on the firm. And as a result, um, the, the idea is that we have to not take into account only uh, a few right, uh, stakeholders, but there are many, many other stakeholders that we have to uh, concern about. Right? Okay, so let's um, do a review of what do we mean by useful accounting information, all right? So many of you uh, might think about uh, accounting information as figures or numbers, but actually when we are talking about accounting information, the, here you can see a balance, right? Um, which is, I would interpret this uh, figure as like that the accounting information presented must be based on, firstly, ethical issues and responsibilities. Okay? So, if the accounting information is uh, lacking uh, responsibility and ethics, then, well, the, the, the basic foundation is, is not right. It's, it's, but the, foundation is broken, is it, right? And then we talk about whether these uh, responsibilities can be accountable, because the idea is that, right, so something is, uh, somebody is responsible, but uh, how, how is the accountability system, right? I'm not just talking about who is accountable, and, uh, but what is the system, right? to make the information accountable, right? And as a result, we have this um, issue also of uh, relevant information, all right? Relevance, basically in accounting, we define it as uh, information that can make a difference, that can make decision making uh, different, okay? And therefore, we talk about another level, which is um, disclosure, that is to say, well, uh, if we have this information, uh, responsible, ethical, accountable, uh, relevant, all right, then we have to disclose the information to the public, all right? And therefore, transparency and accuracy uh, are some other issues that we have to talk about. But at the end, all right, so some of uh, our guests here are from, uh, say, big four audit firms, you know that verification is very important, right? So, um, and that is the main point of our uh, discussion today, all right? So we have information. We claim the information to be uh, 
uh, having all these relevant characteristics, but how do we verify whether such information is uh, verifiable or not, okay? So therefore, we will, uh, therefore, mm, when we touch on the part about uh, mm, media information, then we will talk about that. Okay, so let's go to uh, different types of uh, accounting research methods, right? So um, I just um, want to introduce to you uh, a very, very general kind of perspective. That is to say, we simply define um, some what we call quantitative and qualitative kind of uh, research approach, right? So some accounting research, uh, say we have many uh, professors here also, so um, some may use a kind of, um, say, uh, research approach that relies on a large amount of financial data, such as uh, stock exchange information and calculating accounting returns and stock prices, etc., and relating to probably some issues like, say, corporate governance, um, uh, board composition, and so on, right? So let's call this uh, quantitative, and let's call this in simply, uh, simple form, let's call this empirical studies, right? Uh, but today, what I want to um, uh, advocate is also there is another alternative, right? So we might not be only be playing with uh, stock market figures, but maybe uh, we can use a more human approach, uh, a more sociological or philosophical approach and emphasize on, say, uh, theories such as theories about the institution. Right. So uh, many of our CSR research is actually a matter of philosophical debate rather than, uh, say, running or crunching numbers. Right. Um, so we rely on qualitative as well. Of course, we also need quantitative data. Right. But uh, we would like, say, therefore need to use methods like, for instance, interviews, reading company materials, such as uh, annual reports, CSR reports, and also very important, uh, very, very importantly is uh, how do we verify? Just now in the other slide, we talked about the verification issue, is it? So, uh, when we are using, say, reports or materials, we have to use verification in order to verify. So therefore, here comes the importance of media. All right. So let's, for simplicity, call this uh, qualitative kind of inf uh, research approach. All right. Okay, so here. Another approach is let's mix the two together, right? Say we can have, for instance, a mix quantitative and qualitative, all right? Uh, for instance, very often uh, we might uh, prefer to use, say, like reading company reports, CSR reports, news reports, uh, internet um, pages, etc. Right, and we analyze the contents, and we generally call this uh, content analysis. Right. So, like for instance, um, what we can do is that we can quote, we can quote the qualitative data, and then we can transform the qualitative data into quantitative data. That is a quant plus qual kind of. Um, 
combination approach, right? So actually in the market, we do have uh, many different types of softwares that can help us to do this, all right? So uh, we are not only uh, talking about, say, softwares to search for keywords in English, but uh, you can also have softwares in Chinese and other languages, right? So that's the uh, basic uh, accounting methods, right? So now, mm, let's talk about the sources of the information, right? Okay, so when we are conducting accounting research, so we will have to rely on different sources. So, for instance, as I've mentioned, say corporate annual reports, right? In some countries, um, some uh, big four audit firms or some independent verification parties may do what they call independent third party verification. That is to say, you, okay, you are, suppose you, you, you have a report about a limited company, uh, lim a pub, uh, listed company, all right? And then you say that you have done this CSR, you have done that CSR, all right? And, but the point is, we need verification. Just like financial statements, right? We need verifications and auditing, right? The same with uh, CSR or sometimes they call sustainability reports, right? And other sources include, say, corporate websites, right? So, and also database, right? Especially nowadays, we talk about the issue of big data, right? So actually, there are some uh, database that you can access. Say, like for instance, if you're talking about the uh, COVID-19, or you're talking about the stock market crash, or whatever. <clears throat> so there are some database that you can in fact, uh, access and try to do a triangulation with what the uh, corporate website, what the CSR reports, what the annual reports have been uh, reporting, right? So do a comparison, right? But finally, social media is a very important in, uh, input into our research, okay? So by social media, I don't mean only Facebook or internet, but we also talk about newspapers um, and other, say we have printed forms, magazines. We do have, say, uh, internet. Uh, afterwards, Joan will talk about different types of media uh, uh, forms, okay? So um, this help us to um, try to um, help us to triangulate, that is to say, um, verify, okay? So the key word that I'm talking about is verifiability. That whether the information, the information it can be uh, verifiable, right? So we have to depend on uh, different reports, right, uh, corporate website information, right, so you know that actually in some um, companies, like for instance, we tried to do research some years ago about uh, some state-owned companies in mainland China, so they may not have um, issued uh, corporate reports, but they might have website information, but the difficulty is with the verifiability issue, right? So how can you verify, right, what these companies are uh, boasting about, right? So therefore, media is important, right? Okay, i give you two examples about our team. Okay, I have a research team together with my colleagues, right? So, um, first example is we did a research about um, mm, accounting for Typhoon Hato, right? So, in this study, 
uh, we use quantitative as well as qualitative information and we search for keywords. You can see here, keywords, all right? And those keywords, uh, including like donation, voluntary work, allowance, holiday, relief, etc. cetera, uh, both positive and negative, all right? So uh, taken from, you can see here, newspapers, uh, internet information, and also from the web, okay? So um, we search the keywords, right? But the point is we want to have more reliable and verifiable information. That is what we wish to have, right? So this is one example. A more recent example is, of course, the, the COVID-19, right? So we have... Uh, been doing, okay, it's almost done, right? A, a kind of um, qualitative, informa uh, qualitative research also. And we used mainly information from the media, okay? Collected from the media as well as corporate reports, right? So you can see that we um, have collected, uh, okay, if you are interested, Later on, when the paper is published, you can see that um, we use a large volume of uh, data from many different sources, okay, uh, relating to donations, medical supplies, and quarantine hotels, job securities, um, employment issues, and SMEs, etc. right? So this is under... Um, under construction, okay, but it's almost done. But the idea is that I just want to point out that media is so important in our research, okay, that we have therefore to finally bring up, okay, bring uh, one question, right? Um, so sometimes, sometimes, sometimes the information is only for window dressing, right? Sometimes the information lack third-party verification, not audited, just made up, is it? Sometimes the information might have political or economical consequences. And what about if we are going to say, for instance, sooner or later you will ask about this question, is that uh, if Macau is going to have a uh, stock market or something like that, right? So what about their published reports? Should they follow some kind of international conventions, such as the GRI reporting standards? Okay. So I know some uh, companies, such as the big uh, operators here, they already follow uh, GRI, all right, and we do have many students already perform, uh, performing uh, studies uh, based on their reporting based on GRI. But the idea is that if, like for instance, if you say we're going to have a stock market, okay, and the stock market should require some kind of uh, uh, international standards and this is one of the most important issue, okay? So let me uh, give my uh, presentation to Joang, okay? So my summary here is that we as accounting researchers, we choose the information we need, okay? But we need the media to be ethical. And therefore, let's turn to the issue of media ethics, okay? So thank you very much, and thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Hand to thank you. Juan. Right? Thank you, Carlos. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Now, João has the floor. <laughs> thank you. How do I get I the next is... PowerPoint on? It's together, is it? Uh, no, it's not together. Uh, can... I have it here. It's okay. okay. I can. I can. Write. Right. Thank it's, you very much. Right. It's okay. 
Very well. Uh, so I've been already introduced. Um, thank you for being here. And Carlos mentioned media several times uh, and the importance of media in this process. Um, actually, I think probably Macau is one of the places in the world where uh, it is more uh, complex to uh, look into media. And I think these figures show you the, this high density of media that we live with in Macau. There's a large number of English language daily newspapers. There are Portuguese language newspapers daily, weekly. There's a trilingual weekly. There's a bilingual weekly. Um, there are available, not so much in these COVID times, but uh, previously, we had uh, basically all the titles from Hong Kong available on the newsstands, and they were delivered in our offices um, right early in the morning. So basically, when uh, we arrived at the office, uh, um, Hong Kong titles were already available um, because it was easy to bring it from Hong Kong. Uh, there's also um, uh, titles from Taiwan, and there used to be, and I know some uh, small Filipino stores still have some uh, gossip newspapers from the Philippines, which are sold locally to a very, very eager audience. There are also plenty of magazines. Actually, the number of magazines has been growing over uh, the years in Macau. In terms of broadcast data, uh, broadcast um, uh, media, we have currently uh, six free-to-air TV channels, which is uh, provided by TDM, which is a public broadcaster, two radio stations. Um, the Macau Basic Channels Company, which provides uh, dozens of channels uh, from Hong Kong, mainland China, Taiwan, and also some international channels from uh, Japan. It also has Bloomberg. So the, 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 the range of channels has been uh, a little bit more diverse. And also a pay TV uh, provider uh, in Macau, Macau Cable TV. So, Carlos, you guys must have a lot of work to do when you have to look at all this range of media, three different languages, very different formats, print, broadcast, online, which I, I also, uh, uh, we also have, social media, so newspapers which are basically only available or they are only published uh, online, all about Macau or the Macau concealers, uh, which uh, basically they, they publish online. They don't really have a, much of a physical format um, uh, publication. So it's really, really uh, an incredible job to look at all this. Um, but one of the things which I want to talk about is how media can be different. So you look into a publication and the publication for sure is going to fall in one of these three categories. It's either owned by the state or it's a public media company, a public service company, or it's a commercial media company. And what differentiates this company? And I think this is very much relevant for the work Carl's and his team are doing. Well, what's a state media? Why is it different from public service? Sometimes people tend to confuse state and public because uh, uh, they, they, they sound very much the same because usually public is owned by the state, so state is public. Well, not exactly. What defines what is a state media or a public media? It's not who owns it, but how it's managed and what does it do. And so state media basically provides the audience with the information the government, the state, the official entities want you to know, want the public to know. Whereas public service media gives the audience the information the public needs to know based on a very simple principle, which is the principle of public interest. What is of public interest? What does the public need to know? And finally, uh, commercial media. Well, this probably is easier to, to understand. Um, when we talk about commercial media, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a, a, a company which strives for profit because state media can also look for profit in terms of its operation and, and public service media, the same thing. But basically, commercial media gives the audience the information public wants to know based on the principle of interest of the public. Not public interest, interest of the public. And these two concepts are very, very important, in my opinion, because 
public interests are issues which resonate in everybody's lives. It's issues related with education, pu public health, access to justice. These are issues of public interest. Whereas interest of the public is very much narrow and focused. Someone may have an interest in knowing um, the lifestyle of uh, Hong Kong actors and actresses. That's very much the, at the core of interest of the public. So it focuses on narrower issues which are not, um, do not really have a widespread interest. And so I think when we look at the work uh, Carlos and his team are doing, uh, and having to look at all this, I think it, it really, it's important to have, to, to try to fit each media outlet you're studying or you are analyzing into one of these three characteristics because this tells you what uh, people, what media are, are actually talking about. And if you take this, the very same issue, it will be reported in three different ways in this, under these three categories. So this, I think, it's something that needs to be well understood when you're looking into media. Not all media are the same. We are not all created in the same way. We don't operate under the same guidelines. Uh, our editorial policies are different. They are not exactly the same. And our code of ethics is also not exactly the same. So I think it's very important. These, are, these issues are, are, are very, very important. So usually our code of ethics calls for issues like transparency, accountability towards the public, um, being able to do also verification of the information we are actually publishing. But that is done in three different ways, as we saw, as we saw uh, previously. Um, in Macau, currently, I think those three kinds of media are actually present. If you, I will not name names because uh, I don't think it's, uh, it's correct to do it here. Uh, but you do, we do have uh, media which may not be owned by the state or by the government or by the administration, but it does interpret what the government wants people to know and acts according to that. There are, pub there are public service media which interprets what is of public interest and acts according to that, and there is commercial media in the sense that we want to serve the audiences based on the principle of interest of the public. So when you look into publications, please try to understand where they stand, because I think that is very, very important. Um, and also in terms of uh, ethics, accountability, I think it's very important to talk about something that unfortunately does not exist in Macau. Probably no media in Macau is big enough to have an Obudsman. What is this figure? Well, we, you all know what an Obudsman do. Uh, but in terms of media, this is a very uh, important figure which actually has been declining its importance because of uh, the new interaction that there is between um, uh, audiences uh, and, uh, and um, the producers of information between the consumers and the producers. Basically, this is someone who represents. So the Abundsman represents the interests of the public inside the publication, inside the media company. As I said, we don't have this uh, in Macau. Usually this only exists in large uh, media companies. But uh, where it exists, it ensures that the interests of the public are represented inside the company. And by saying this, it ensures that news that are published will not um, violate the trust the public has in that specific media. So this, this uh, um, most, uh, the, the biggest international uh, media organizations, they, they have it. Uh, it's someone that any, any uh, member of the audience can actually write to uh, 
um, and ask them to, to represent them in the, in, in the process of correcting the news uh, or changing editorial policies, editorial guidelines to a certain extent, um, or can ask actually the Obundsman to look into the way a news was done to see if it was done following the basic principles of uh, being fair, being impartial, being transparent, listening to all sides of the problem. So this is something that is uh, very, uh, very important. So um, I, I, I don't have the, well, the academic background that Carlos has, so I have a very much uh, um, hands-on approach, being myself a, a, a journalist, and that's basically what I had for you uh, today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, uh, João. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, well, I guess uh, many of you would be um, eager to uh, throw in a couple of questions. Uh, remarks are also welcome. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, anyone would like to, to jump in? Um, Paul, oh, okay, <laughs> please <laughs> introduce yourself. Yes, thank you very Hi. much. Thank you for the presentation. Yes, My name is Rebecca and uh, I run a marketing media agency mm -hmm. in Macau. Um, my question is on the social issues. Um, nowadays, um, it's very hard to uh, believe whether a media is uh, true with the facts and uh, what to believe or what not to believe. And uh, very often, uh, readers have the perspective that whoever is the boss of the media, they have a standpoint. So um, is that true with the uh, situations in Macau? And how, as a reader, we should uh, look at this um, situation in Macau? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. Maybe I can say uh, something about this. Yeah, yeah, maybe we, we, you will take it one, one by one. Then I guess Professor Paul Cardinal is over there. Uh, so Joan, I perhaps? think, <clears throat> yes, I think you, uh, Rebecca, you were Thank probably you. talking about the so-called fake news phenomena. So uh, where, um, where does the audience stand? Where, whether they can believe something or not. So. Uh, I think that requires another seminar to talk about fake news and <laughs> verification, uh, which I gladly offer to do one day if uh, yeah. Dr. Rucunha would accept. <laughs> um, there are the issue, the, the issue, the key word here is trust. Um, in Macau, we don't have a problem of fake news. So, um, most media in Macau do their job correctly. They make mistakes, but the mistake is not a fake news because what characterizes the fake news is a willingness to mislead people, to portray some situation in a different light, to, uh, um, to um, create a situation in which people are led to believe something else to take a picture out of context, and this is very, very easy to do. When you publish a photo, you can take this photo out of context very easily. To manipulate images, and now even to a, a higher degree, deep fakes. The, the deep fakes in which, <laughs> through uh, artificial intelligence, you can actually match the face and the voice and tr completely transform uh, um, what someone is saying into something completely different. We don't have that issue in Macau. But the issue is media literacy, jumping to another point, which is teaching audiences how to identify fake news. And believe me, this is easy. This is not difficult at all. With, uh, the, right, um, with the right tools, anyone, even an eight-year-old kid, can identify if something is true or not true once it is published. Uh, and I think if I just give this example, you see how, how easy it, it is. If you see a news somewhere else, if you don't see it anywhere else, it might not be true. If it's important 
and it's not anywhere else, it's probably not true. Or if it's not, not anywhere else in the next day, because it can be a scoop, it can be you know, an exclusive. But if you don't see a follow-up on the next day, then it's not true. So the question is, and this is something which I've written a little bit about, it's media literacy, it's teaching people. And actually, it's starting since they are small kids in school, not uh, at uh, elementary level, but at high school level to start introducing in subjects like Portuguese, like uh, language um, or uh, social sciences, uh, some elements of uh, verification uh, and how to address these issues. And this is a pressing issue which I believe the education sector is not really, not really interested to, or is not really aware that they need to start, the schools need to start teaching kids uh, since a rather small age to, um, have a critical look into the information they receive, mostly through social media, and to be able to differentiate what is right, what is wrong, what is true, what is not. Another way of uh, judging whether something is fake news or not is to ask Donald Trump. So everything yeah, yeah, yeah. that is... <laughs> or maybe you'll get a, a distorted perspective on it, but that's mm -hmm. another debate. Uh, 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 Professor Carlos Noronha, you are... You consume, I can see you read newspapers day and night. Uh, you, yes, this is true. I mean, the first time I met Carlos was while he was reading uh, newspapers in Portuguese, English, Chinese. Uh, so as a, as, a, as a consumer, as a news junkie, if I may say, um, from the, and also from your perspective um, of, um, of, uh, of accounting and uh, auditing uh, scholarly, what, what would you have to add? Well, I would um, say that actually the different uh, languages of the media, uh, Chinese, Portuguese, English, uh, they really have different focuses. Um, um, say, we talked about this some time ago, if you watch the TV news in three different languages, you get three different worlds, actually. <laughs> Um, so therefore, that was um, my idea of um, talking up to a reporter today that um, there should be some kind of more uh, convergence all right, in terms of um, the focus. Right? Say the same news, same piece of news could be interpreted in many different ways. And as a result, when we do research, it gives us an opportunity to choose what we want to use. And that is not objective enough uh, to a certain extent, right? So, um, so I would hope that um, the association of uh, media of different newspapers can actually come up with a more uh, concerted effort in, say, bringing into some more consensus uh, when reporting a particular piece of news. <laughs> well, the, thank you, Carlos. <laughs> but of course, the, one I, of, one I of respect that, editorial yes. choices. Of course. Of course. All right, but um, when we choose, okay, we, 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 we are given many different kinds of candies. Okay? <laughs> so that's, that's great. So we are very, we, yeah, we, we're kind of looking to account to some extent. We have the, all, uh, the highest media density yes. uh, in the probably world. in the world yes. and the different, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, plurality and different perspectives at least. But that's, uh, that is as Joan mentioned, that, uh, the three different levels. So we have to uh, put into our mind that, okay, when we are, uh, choosing a piece of news, uh, whether it is uh, for the public interest or interest of the public, is it? So it's very important. So I think uh, yes. we have we have here uh, 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 Professor Paul Cardinal. Paul, Am Paul. I right? Yes, please. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it is a, a pleasure for me to be here and to see my esteemed former colleague Professor Noronha, and of course. I also know for many years uh, João Francisco Pinto, and it has been very enlightened, and I believe it is very relevant in the days we are living. And uh, a proof of this is this space is full 
So mm -hmm. this is really an interesting, relevant topic. And re regarding mm -hmm. ethics, we know since Aristotle, our social life is permeated directly or indirectly, expressly or not expressly, is permeated by ethics. Or if you want to look more to the geographical area we are with, we can, for example, recall Motsu. So ethics is a fundamental piece of our social, social life. And in the Professor Noronha presentation, he provides us a series of links in order to have verification of the accountability. The first link is ethics and then responsibility uh, and several others as it was shown. My point is, my question is, in these days where freedom of the press is under threat, either by authoritarian regimes, by sort of paranoid new legislation regarding, for example, COVID-19 or other issues, in which point will this impact in ethics? And if that first link, ethics, is corrupted because of an authoritarian regime, because of a crazy populist guy like Donald Trump, because of whatever, if that first link is broken, how can you doing your job be assured that by the end of the day you have correct data, you have verification? This is one point. Another point that I would like to raise, and uh, I was not planning to do it, but it was popped, it popped up here, and it's very relevant. A new law that I know IPIM tried very much to fight in the sense of a specific article related to the so-called fake news or uh, I don't know, I will not uh, mm -hmm. make adjectivations of that because I want to keep uh, the level high. And uh, what will be the impact of that new law, that new specific law in your work as journalists? Because as you said, it is very simple. If you want to deliberately provide fake news, you are doing something. Something ethically wrong, something juridically wrong, mm -hmm. that cannot be compared to someone giving news that proves later not so easy to confirm, or even more, it does not belong to the pattern someone or some entity would wish to pertain. So these are my two questions, and thank you very much. And again, congratulate Fundação Rui Cunha again, bringing public service, public interest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, Professor. Um, well, <laughs> well, it's a very, it's a very, very interesting, very <laughs> interesting and, important. and uh, yeah. challenging question. Yes. All right. So um, basically, um, like for instance in, okay, I, I just talk about my area of accounting research. Okay, so uh, we uh, usually, say, collect from um, different sources, say, um, numbers, say, for instance, how much uh, did a company invest in environmental protection, uh, how much did they invest in, say, um, labor protection, and so on, okay, and also the frequencies, and also... Uh, another way is to look at the qualitative aspects, that is, whether they describe in full uh, whether this kind of act activities of CSR all right, uh, are believable, okay? But the, again, back to that point is that, okay, like what you have mentioned, if, say, if the media is controlled by you mentioned, the, say, an authoritarian uh, state or whatever entity, then it is a little bit difficult unless we have a more open market that we can have, say, third-party verification or auditing. And otherwise, um, it's like that we just have to believe in these figures, but... Um, Mm, like John also mentioned that sometimes we do have some uh, web information, um, not only printed materials, okay? 
and they could be used as sources of triangulation. But my uh, basic intention in today's uh, tonight's seminar is that we need urgently to have third party verification and professionally done. Not like in some places you okay, you just ask one guy who is a teacher in a university and then they sign this and then they say, okay, this is verified. Okay. All right. So what you are reporting as CSR, your company or your or hotel or your resort is doing very good. Okay, I just sign here, okay. So we need professional um, and international, like I mentioned also, the GRI guidelines, all right. So we need some professional and international um, um, practices, okay. Mm -hmm. So, yes. It's interesting, Carlos, you're, you're referring to verification and third-party verification, mm -hmm. and João was talking about uh, media literacy. Uh, and João, we, we do have a thriving uh, stream of uh, verifica verificators, is that the word? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Fact-checking, uh, also out of, this, out, of, out of this need, and you've uh, dealt with some of, these, yes. uh, uh, some of these people. And also, uh, to address Paul's, yeah, I, I, Paul's question I will start about, to, uh, about Civil Protection Act. Yes, uh, the, the Civil Protection uh, Bill, yeah. the initial proposal, did represent a huge concern for the meeting in Macau because uh, it brought about the concept that uh, by publishing something which would not be actually true... Fake uh, and fake bias. Then, yes. Um, uh, and it qualified um, unfounded. that unfounded. Yeah. Uh, that would be a crime and the journalist and the publication would be liable. I think the reaction in the local society was, um, was uh, quite striking. So uh, a lot of people spoke about against, spoke against this, uh, the way the article was drafted. And uh, in the final version, uh, as a journalist, I cannot say I'm fully satisfied. Uh, I, would, I wouldn't want to see that article in that law because press freedom is press is regulated by its own law, it's, and everything is there. Our responsibility as journalists uh, are there, so <laughs> we are responsible as journalists. So we, we are accountable towards uh, the society and, uh, and uh, the legal system as a journalist. So I don't like to see that, that article there, but the way it's currently, the way it has been approved and the current wording makes me feel more at ease. Does it make me feel 100% at ease? No, neither me nor my colleagues, but we can live with that. We can live with that because the way it is written, for, for someone to be liable to, to, to actually to, to, to break into that, you, you need to deliberately publish something which you actually know it's not true and not even try to go about discovering if it's true or not. So uh, in that sense, it's, it makes me more relaxed about uh, the way it's drafted. But, um, uh, and uh, the lawyers here and Paulo also, he, he knows that Macau has a, has a very good press law. Uh, it was approved many years ago, but it's still a very modern law which should not be touched uh, and should be left as it is because it has served the media of Macau brilliantly. And we have had, over the years, very few cases which ended up in courts regarding uh, abuse of press freedom. Uh, and most of the cases that actually end up in court, they were settled outside court uh, by agreement between both sides. And that, that really shows that uh, the law is good and um, we should not touch it. We should not even talk about the law because it's better we don't talk about it or, uh, or else someone will remember, that law is too old, maybe we should uh, <laughs> take a look at it. So let's not talk about that. Yes, yes. Verification, media literacy. Yeah. Yes, there are even now, um, 
There's a kind of a yeah. booming industry, if it's, I may say. It's a booming so, uh, Providing industry. services, I say. It's a booming industry, but I think the most uh, interesting efforts in terms of uh, media verification are quite collective. Are, they are quite collective. They are, um, in, usually, we compete. Every company competes with another. But when it comes to uh, verification of news, actually, there's no competition. Everybody is working together. And at the international level, uh, organizations such as, in terms of TV, the BBC, NHK, uh, Deutsche Welle, um, uh, Rai in Italy, uh, CNN, they work together. Whenever something comes out that needs to be verified, and usually, where did these things come out? They come from social media. It's a video posted on a, on a social media account that shows something or a photo. And actually, these large international media groups, they work together to try to identify if that's true or not. I give you just a few examples for you to understand how they work. Something comes out, let's say, of Syria. And it's claimed to be in a certain region of the country and recently. OK, so BBC will tap into their people that speak Arabic to understand if are they really speaking Arabic with the accent from that region where it's supposed to be? Because if not, it's not true. Um, so they claim to be from, let's say, three days ago. How was the weather like three days ago? And mm -hmm. we can tap into these resources. It's easy. So was it sunny, raining, hot, cold? And then you can see the way people dress. And they say this was at, uh, let's say, in the morning time. Let's look at the shadows of the people. Does it really show it's the kind of shadow? Is it morning or it's like more like noon? So, and, and these resources, when they operate collectively, they help each other and they share the information. And it's actually not very difficult to, uh, uh, to, to look into that and to say this has a good chance of being correct or this stands no chance, it doesn't pass. It's not correct at all. So um, there are companies doing this commercially uh, and there, are, there is a, a consortium of uh, large international media organizations doing this collectively to address the problem of fake news. Well, I, I'm just going to use my prerogative, though I'm not a speaker here, but I'll just, uh, and per se, thank you, that would be a, a different issue. But I guess w if I'm uh, um, getting it, I believe I'm getting it right, what uh, Paul was hinting at is uh, the wider problem of uh, the chilling effect of all this. Am I right, Paul? Okay, so that, so that, that, yeah, is, that is an just issue. Say that, yes, you are, and let me just say that João Francisco Pinto was also right. The press law that we have, it's good. Let it be like it is, okay? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Uh, Professor Paul. Um, uh, how about uh, more um, perspectives, uh, views on, uh, on the matters that we've uh, been talking about, on what uh, the speakers uh, um, talked about, and something else you'd like to add, uh, perhaps, please? Ah. Ah. Highly uh, successful editor. Uh, everybody knows I mm -hmm. don't uh, mention his mm -hmm. name. And <clears throat> I said to him, uh, you are so successful though, with newspapers and other media. And couldn't you not use your media to promote uh, ethical values? Because I knew he is also Christian. His very blunt answer was, no, you don't make money with values. Mm. So uh, <laughs> this is also I want to address these issues. Are you also so cynical so that <clears throat> the gorilla in the room is how to make money, to increase money, and this takes precedence over uh, sharing values. See, I think uh, we have to at least to admit this statement was very honest. Uh, at the end, it's just how to increase the profit. Uh, over ethics. Thank you very much for for your presentation, Dr. Stephen. Uh, it is, and actually, your institution uh, 
surely is also uh, 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 related to uh, or highly cherishes all these uh, these matters. Um, uh, value. So value and values. Adding value to values and values may add value uh, in a much broader sense. Uh, and actually, in a cynical way, I would even go farther, but this is a bit of a provocation, that uh, uh, being ethical may also be good for business. Yes. <laughs> we don't, I don't think... In addition to being the right thing, in addition to the intrinsic value of, 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 of ethics. Please, Joe. Um, public service media, which I mentioned there, has basically three roles. One is to inform, another one is to entertain, and the third one, which most people never think about, is to educate. So what you mentioned is actually at the core of the concept of public service media, to educate. And so public service media does have the duty and the role to address values, to promote values, to promote ethical values. Obviously, this does not represent, and how is this done? Well, this is done, for instance, in the way news are done, in the way issues are explained while people are being informed, and this is also done by entertaining people. And actually, one of the best ways to teach people is to entertain them and to feed them what we want them to, to keep in their minds through the entertainment, because that's easy education. So, uh, if you go to a commercial media, they will, the answer is we don't make money promoting values, uh, but that wouldn't be the answer of someone managing a public service media. The answer would be values are Promoting values are within our core uh, mission. And we do it by the way we do our news, the way, the kind of entertainment we provide, and also in the smaller scale by providing educational uh, content. Carlos, uh, like picking on uh, what yeah, Dr. Um, Stephen Rothlin from the well, Research Institute was talking about and Jerome Pinto. It's, it's a very, it's, it's, a, mm -hmm. it's an interesting, uh, Proposition. Yeah, if if um, if if Jenny, you don't mind, <laughs> because we 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 don't we, we did a study about creating value Out through value. CSR, right? So um, may I introduce Jenny, my co-researcher? Uh -huh. Oh yes, <laughs> she's president of the executive she's the council president of, of the our Macau MI CSR for corporate social GC, Yeah, and. We did something Jenny similar, Guan. talking about, say, how to create value through CSR education and CSR reporting. So can Jenny, you talk a little bit about this research? Um, for CSR reporting, uh, usually uh, being used by uh, those uh, public company as a tool, as a communication tool. Uh, uh, with their uh, stakeholders, as mentioned by Professor Noronia just now. Um, however, if uh, the stakeholders, when, when they reading these uh, reports, there are many contents, uh, many contents are very informative, actually. For example, uh, I, I can take the uh, environmental information as an example. Uh, in the logistic industries, for example, they may uh, inform uh, the readers how they uh, do the green logistics, for example, the, the, the material they consume, the packaging material they consume, and how they manage the uh, waste materials, and uh, how they uh, build up a green warehouse, and try to uh, change all those uh, uh, equipment or machines uh, may uh, release some polluted airs uh, then to some electronic uh, things which uh, can produce very clean energy. So all this information actually uh, when they uh, stated in the reports, um, in another way when reader uh, saw 
saw this, when readers see, uh, see this information, actually they, they already been educated. They know what they need to do uh, in their practice. Yeah. Yeah. Thank cool. you, Jenny. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, I guess you can uh, get to know what's more of the uh, uh, brilliant researchers and the papers uh, that have been written by under, under the Institute. Our by, team. Uh, all right. by, by the team, yes. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, and all the people here. Uh, anyone else would like to? Uh, yes, yeah. uh, Professor Morris. I may simply address you as Mauricio, no? <laughs> no, maybe <laughs> Professor, yes, Morris Liu. Yes, please. Thank you, uh, Jose. Thank I'm you. Uh, very impressed by the interesting and insightful talks by Professor Noronia and Mr. Pintu. Uh, and I'm uh, very interested in account and media as well. Um, if we'll have, say, a Macau Stock Exchange in the future, then we'll have more listed companies here. And there's a possibility that those companies will report fake, fake figures later on. There's a such possibility. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the media can play a role in combating those accounting scandals because the media can uh, detect the wrongdoings. And when the little companies know that they could be detected by the media, they, they, they will hesitate in uh, reporting fake figures. Right? So in that sense, media can kind of prevent those uh, fraudulent reporting. Uh, and of course, uh, it's finally also up to whether the media eventually report those wrongdoings or not. Uh, and my question is, well, uh, how, how can we measure the effectiveness of the media in preventing, detecting, and reporting, um, you know, the uh, fraudulent financial reporting behaviors? Thank you, thank you, Professor Morris. Uh, uh, João uh, is a graduate. Actually, he's a, a well-seasoned uh, journalist, uh, uh, but he's also a graduate in, in um, economics. economics. And he started his career uh, in the financial news, in a financial newspaper. In a newspaper mm -hmm. And so you, you actually, when you were working on a daily basis with these matters, you had to come across this because uh, when you used to report about listed companies and what Professor Morris is uh, raising is, uh, is also an interesting issue. Yes, it is, but uh, the, the question is, um, it's not easy for the media to actually uh, discover any uh, manipulation of figures. Uh, because in order to do that, that, that is the role of the auditors. The auditors have access to the inside of the company, and they can look into figures and, and go bit by bit checking if everything is correct. It is not easy for uh, a media company uh, to actually do that because there's no access to internal documents. Um, what media usually identifies are um, Announcements, for instance, comp listed companies, they have to make announcements to the, to the market, disclosing certain information, or informing of upcoming investments. And usually what the financial press does is um, follow up on that, upon, on the pre uh, predicted completion date of that project. Was it done, was it not done? And then understand to which extent that announcement had an impact on the stock share when actually nothing was going to happen. So this is something that in Macau we don't really have that capacity. There's not, uh, uh, the, the, well, the financial, uh, the financial media is not big enough and uh, developed enough to, to do that. But this was something that uh, back in 1992, when I started working, uh, we did. It was uh, looking at the announcements by uh, companies listed in the Lisbon Stock Exchange and following up on that a few months later. Was this done? Was this not done? And then looking into the correlation with the stock price. Did it go up? And that at least gave us something to write about. And, uh, and we could go back to the company and ask, your share price went up, you didn't do it, what actually happened? 
you need to talk about this, you know? So, but in Macau, I don't think this, this can be done. Um, Carlos, this boils down to the wider issue of accountability in a broader sense. Actually, yeah. accountability and transparency is what kind of, to a great extent, bring us uh, together. Uh, when we're talking about um, ethics, uh, 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 surely um, uh, some, and, and, and adherence to truth mm. is uh, uh, it, 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 part of the backbone of what a journalism should do. Well, truth not in a in a in a, an ideal uh, um, terms uh, in absolute terms, but in an intellectually honest way. So it's like it's a process of seeking the truth. Um, accuracy is a, is is a key, but of course, in all uh, what we have to integrate in terms of being balanced and fair and taking into account the different perspectives and the different stakeholders in a certain matter. But the issue of accountability is is is, is greatly important. How do you assess the issue of having a vibrant? A vibrant Professor Maurice Liu was, uh, and Juan was kind of referring to sh shortcomings that we have here and for us. But but the issue of if we are to develop new financial services uh, in Macau, if we are to have uh, some sort of um, capital market or stock exchange in some format, we do need a vibrant, free, and credible press, and strong, because we need checks and balances and, and accountability. Exactly. Right? Yes. Sorry, I mean, maybe I'm answering the question. Yeah, I'm answering already. Say, 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 okay. So I, mean, I, I went too far. <laughs> but please, just, just uh, for I, you to I comment. I will just simply summarize that mm. um, journalism, media, accounting, auditing, and the academia should be together. They That's should right. be holding hands, uh, hand in hand. All right. Uh, and that is how we achieve verification. So because... <clears throat> Say, if we only have uh, auditing of financial figures, but we don't have auditing of, say, um, CSR or, or, or other context. So at the end, so like what Zhuang mentioned about those stock, stock prices changes and what did they do, what did they not do. So this is a very common kind of um, situation in our accounting research. So... Uh, at the end, I would simply conclude that uh, media, accounting, auditing, and the academia uh, should hold hand in hand for uh, information verification. So that is, a, <laughs> I think that's a great way to wrap it up. If yes. someone wants to uh, uh, have, add something, please, we have a couple of minutes. Well, if not, uh, well, I'd like to thank you very much, Fundação Rui Cunha. Uh, Carlos Noronha and the Macau Institute, Teresa Chu, Jenny Kwan and all the team um, from the Macau Institute for Corporate Social Responsibility, João on behalf of, uh, of our association and the media sector. Mm -hmm. It was really a fruitful and very interesting um, exchange here. Um, and Carlos, uh, I have to credit this to you because you are the one uh, who uh, has been uh, uh, promoting this idea of bringing us together. And I, and I guess we do have a, a kind of a small epistemic community here in the making, I would say. So thank you very much. And uh, now we've got some... Uh, uh, please announce. The oh, yes. Oh, of course. I'm yeah. sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the light. Oh, yes, of course. Now... We would like, of course, to thank you all uh, because this was a very, very a great turnout uh, and, and it's really um, uh, rewarding for, for all of us to can see that there's uh, and, and sense this interest. So I guess there's been a lot of food for thought and some of you are a bit hungry, so we have we got some snacks. Um, uh, you know, Hong Chao, yes, no, no, you can, so we can, we can, we can continue all this conversation, this discussion. Can you please uh, announce yeah. the location? Yeah. Oh, yes, the, oh, yes, of course, you are absolutely right. No, this is, uh, I'm just a bit everyone tired Everyone is today. invited. Yes, yeah, so I was like, so everyone is invited to go to the cathedral. Yeah. Not to the church, though we can go to the church, but maybe it's closed. But the cathedral is a is a the cafe is a, co a coffee shop bar. You have some uh, snacks and uh, 
beer and tea. So, yes, yes so if just, you are uh, not sure about the location, yeah. our staff will help. You. Will help. It's just, mm -hmm. uh, it's just um, across, uh, uh, five minutes walk. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. So thank you very much, thank and you. thank you very much, Rui Kunya Foundation, to you all. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, the <but> <laughs> I was looking, there's no food there. Thank you.